Merci beaucoup. Who's ready to axe the tax? Who's ready to build the homes? Who's ready to fix the budget? Who's ready to stop the crime? as properly scripted by my team, talking about my common sense plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. But I was interrupted by the testimony I just read from our very own Prime Minister just yesterday. He said something incredible, although not so surprising. Of course, what we're investigating <laughs> is whether a foreign dictatorship interfered in our democracy in multiple elections to help him win. A communist dictatorship seeking to keep in office someone who said he admires that communist dictatorship. But his defense actually speaks for itself. The Prime Minister was asked why he didn't do anything about this interference, even though he was warned in briefing notes is that he doesn't read briefing notes. <laughs> now, we often don't believe the things that this guy says, but I think that most Canadians would believe that defense. <laughs> I think it's plausible that Justin Trudeau doesn't read documents that come before him. Um, in fact, I think it's likely that he doesn't read things that come before him. And I think that that defense is interesting for three reasons. One, because the ivory tower elites who support him and his ideology of concentrating all the power in their and money in their hands uh, they seem they always tell us how wonderfully sophisticated and cosmopolitan they are and how brilliant they are and that's why they're entitled they're experts after all right uh, th that's why they're entitled to decide for other people um, but yet they're prepared to support a guy who says he doesn't read it's like, he might be a know-nothing, but he's our know-nothing, right? <laughs> they support a guy who confuses decimals with decibels, who says budgets balance themselves, even when they never do, <laughs> who says he doesn't think much about monetary policy, admits he's not very good with numbers, advises Canadians to pay for their tuition and their home renovations on their credit card. And this is the bright light, the genius that they believe should be able to run the lives of, of mechanics who are able to take apart an engine and put it back together with blindfolds on. That, that, that the single mom who can budget her, balance her budget on a minimum wage salary needs advice on budgeting from the guy who can't budget uh, for himself. That is the ultimate irony of the elitism, is that these so pseudo-intellectuals vest all their faith in this guy of all people. The second thing that's so interesting, and this came up, by the way, in his defense on another scandal, when he had accepted a quarter million dollar free vacation from someone who had met with him asking for, and later received, a $15 million grant from his government. The kind of uh, cronyism that would get a small town mayor put in jail. But the defense the Prime Minister gave at the time was that in the meeting, he didn't actually, he, he, it, wasn't he, it wasn't substantially important because he actually doesn't run the government. He's a ceremonial figurehead. And therefore, he didn't have any actual power over the government he heads to give the individual what he was asking for in exchange for that famous free vacation. Even though, in the Prime Minister's own Open and Accountability Guide, the machinery of government, and that's a quote, is the exclusive responsibility of the Prime Minister. Which brings me to the second reason why his I don't read my briefing notes defense is so interesting. And it is this, he wants all the power and none of the responsibility. He literally wants to control the entire economy. He wants to nationalize large industries with monstrous taxpayer funded subsidies. And yet he, he, he wants to print $600 billion without having any responsibility for the resulting inflation. 
He wants to increase the cost of government without taking any of the blame for the resulting interest payments that households must pay on their own debt after he drove up the rates. He wants none of the responsibility for the fact that we have the slowest economic growth in the OECD over the next five years and over the next 35 years after he promised all this spending was going to stimulate the contrary. He wants to have total control over what you can see and say online to protect us all from these dangerous forces that might influence our thinking if we are not protected by the angels in the government. And yet, when there is actually a risk of manipulation by hostile and malicious actors like, say, a communist regime in Beijing, he can't even take the responsibility of reading his briefing notes. This is the irony, the great irony of his leadership, and one of the reasons why I think he's succeeded in doubling housing costs, giving us the worst inflation in 40 years, sending 2 million people to the food banks, 8,000 people signing up for a Facebook group called the Dumpster Diving Network because they now have to eat out of a garbage can after he drove food prices rising with his carbon tax. He wants to control every aspect of your life, and then when he ruins your life, he wants to take none of the responsibility for the ruin that he caused. And the third reason why this testimony and this entire scandal is so consequential and indicative is why the hell did a dictatorship, a communist dictatorship, on the other side of the world consider it such a, a, a strategic imperative to keep this guy as Prime Minister? What was their motive? Why did they believe that they would be better off by having him as our Prime Minister in at least two elections where they intervened to help him win? Why? Because he's good for Canada? Or is it because he admires their basic Chinese communist dictatorship? He admits that he admires Fidel Castro and his policy agenda would seem to point in that direction. And that direction is the topic of my speech today because it is a radical departure from the common sense Canadian way. And if you want to know about that common sense Canadian way, take a walk in the town centre of Saskatoon. Why? Anybody from Saskatoon here? Well, there's two reasons why you should do that. One, because, of course, Saskatoon is my mother's hometown, so it's, it's a historic place uh, um, <laughs> and a very important place. And the second reason is that you will see a beautiful pair of statues together of a paper boy named John Diefenbaker selling a newspaper to Wilfrid Laurier. Laurier was in Saskatoon on July 29th, uh, sorry, excuse me, July 29th, 1910. Sorry, I didn't bring my notes, just like Justin, I don't read, so I, if I am... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Deef, and Deef is out on the streets selling newspapers, and along comes a prime minister who that day was laying a cornerstone at a college uh, of the University of Saskatchewan, and... D D Laurier actually buys a newspaper from this kid, gives him 25 cents. By the way, that was before just inflation, when 25 cents was a lot of money. And uh, so the two of them talk for a little while. I think Laurier later, later in the day recounted this conversation with this young whippersnapper. And before the conversation could come to an end, Deef said, being a good conservative, said to himself, I'm not making any sales right now, I've got to wrap this up. He said, sorry, Prime Minister, but I can't waste any more time with you. I have more newspapers to sell. <laughs> but there you had a future Prime Minister who was then a paper boy. I was a paper boy too, by the way. Um, and um, a current Prime Minister. And you'd think, those, these two guys have nothing in common. One was a liberal, the other was a conservative, the other was a French Catholic, the other was a English-speaking Baptist. One was a Quebecer, the other was a Prairie boy. 
They, their terms were separated by almost half a century. But in fact, they had plenty in common. They both believed in the common wisdom and the common sense of the common people. When Laurier was asked, what is Canada's nationality? Now, in most places, a leader in that time would have defined nationality based on religion, ethnicity, or some other demarcation line of the sort. But he could do no such thing because even back then, over a century ago, we were all mixed up. Right? We had, of course, the first peoples. We had the French, the English, the Scots, the Irish. Asian immigrants were already starting to arrive on our shores, so we couldn't define ourselves by ethnicity. We had, we had Catholic and Protestant, and the arrival of new religions, uh, to, new from a North American point of view, to our continent and to our country. And so he defined Canada and its nationality the following way. He said, Canada is free, and freedom is its nationality. Now, <laughs> Diefenbaker would later sign the Bill of Rights, and on it he would write, I am a Canadian, a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship God in my own way, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I believe wrong. This heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and all of mankind. Both of them believed in our ancient liberties, liberties that we had inherited and that had been passed down over 800 years from 1215, the Magna Carta, all the way to then and to now. Liberties that they believed for, for which they were the custodians. They were simply, they were not the owners of that liberty, they were simply the guardians whose job it was to take the torch and pass it on, as Edmund Burke explained, a contract between the yet, the, the, the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. They understood, thank you very much, Roy. Dr. Roy gave me a round of applause there. Uh, thank you, Roy. Speaking of nonpartisanship, I'll be conservative in my remarks if you be liberal in your applause, all right? Um, but thank you, Dr. Roy. And they, understood, they weren't there to reinvent the universe. They didn't, thought, they didn't think that they were the living embodiment of God, that they could engineer humans and populations and re recreate some brave new world. They were here to inherit the great gifts that ancestors before them had passed down. And they understood that Canada wasn't perfect, just as we look back at our history today and acknowledge it wasn't perfect. And you know what, though? Whenever we have gone wrong, it is because we have gotten away from those basic principles of human freedom and in favored too much state coercion and control, not the other way around. And that that common sense consensus guided our country for its first hundred years. It went into hibernation between about 1967 and 1984. And then it reawoke, it reawakened uh, in, uh, the, with the election of the great Brian Mulroney, uh, who reversed the course of the previous decade and a half. Of course, he, in, he inherited the country in a total mess high unemployment and inflation interest rates were in the double digits. The suicide rate had reached its highest level in Canadian history the year before, as so many people were losing their homes and their jobs as a direct result of excessive government control uh, and uh, uh, coercion and the, the absolutely insane policies that had drowned our country in debt. And so Brian Mulroney set out in 1984 to reduce the size of the state, to get rid of unnecessary red tape and regulations, to privatize 23 crown corporations, to bring us into an operating surplus. We did have an actual deficit that was entirely the interest payments on Pierre Elliott Trudeau's debt, but the operating balance of the government was positive. He signed the biggest and most successful free trade agreement in Canadian history. And if you think I just want to praise him because he was on the blue team, I will say that the subsequent Kretchen and Martin governments 
carried on and in fact accentuated all of his policies. Not only did they not reverse free trade or free markets or re-regulate or renationalize, they actually continued privatizing, continued saving money for the government. And if we can be even more nonpartisan about it, we have to give Jean Chrétien credit because he cut the CBC, right? Um, and uh, that was a great idea. And, and then we had, of course, The great Stephen Harper, who lowered taxes further by freeing up more of our people, people's paychecks uh, so that they could spend those, that, that money themselves, they could be rewarded for their hard work. He unleashed for free enterprise even further and kept our country, with the exception of the great global recession, at or close to a balanced budget where it remained until 2015. This was the common sense Canadian consensus, the common sense Canadian way that believed in hard work, self-reliance, free markets, free trade, that there should be a social safety net to do for people what they could not do for themselves. The government should genuinely be, fear, be there for the least fortunate among us and that we should give them the opportunity to climb up the ladder of life. This was the consensus, but at the same time, the consensus rejected the notion that government should control what you think, what you believe, how your money should be spent. It believed that budgets should, unless in exceptional circumstances, be balanced and debt should be limited so that our precious public resources could go to nurses and doctors and soldiers, not bankers and bondholders. Now, Justin Trudeau came along in 2015 now, to be clear, a lot of people say that he's gone too far, that he took liberalism in the wrong, not just far, but in an extreme direction. I disagree, because what Justin Trudeau has done is not only to break with the common sense Canadian consensus, it's to break with liberalism himself, itself. Liberals used to believe in laissez-faire, let people make their own decisions and live their own lives. Different strokes for different folks. Remember that? That people could more or less think for themselves, decide for themselves, and live their lives in their own way, as Pierre Elliott Trudeau famously plagiarized when he said that the government had no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Now, his son wants the government to be in every room of your house and your business and your wallet, and your bank account, and your internet account. He wants to be everywhere always. See, the thing is, it's not that Justin Trudeau is too liberal. It's that he's not liberal at all. He is deeply, deeply illiberal. He uses the soft blue eyes and fluffy hair and fancy socks, and more importantly, the historic brand of the Liberal Party built up by such great leaders as Laurier and many more who followed him, as a cover for what is a radical departure from the Canadian way, a radical departure that sees in every way that the people are to be made small so that the government can be made big. He dis and we see the, the consequences of this. You see, even if he were competent, it is not possible for any one person to run 40 million other people. It is simply not possible. Humans are far too complicated, their interactions far too numerous for one central authority, no matter how wise and virtuous it claims to be, to make all the decisions for them. It has to leave them to make as many decisions as possible for themselves. Worse yet, so when you have the only thing worse than having some all-knowing elite try to control everybody's life is to have someone doing that when he doesn't even read his briefing notes, <laughs> right? <laughs> because not only will he overrule the common sense of the common people, but he will do it badly as he has done, and hence the consequences that we see uh, with uh, today. 76% of
of Canadians telling pollsters, who, 76% of folks who don't yet own a home believe they never will. This would have been unimaginable eight years ago. Unimaginable. It would have been unimaginable eight years ago, before Justin Trudeau, to think that not only would he pass a law to control what you can see and say on the internet, but the, the, he would then pa put forward another law which could put you under house arrest or a peace bond under suspicion of something unacceptable, you might say, in the future. You know, this guy, if he read, if he had read 1984, he would have thought it was an instruction manual <laughs> and not a warning. <laughs> Fortunately, there is an outbreak of common sense across the country. Yes, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, General Hillier said that he, the thing he hears the most often when he walks around the streets of this country is, this is not Canada. We don't recognize this place. And that's what I hear from fifth, everything from fifth generation Canadians to uh, immigrants who arrived here 10 years ago, they say, my God, what happened to this country in the last eight years? Do you imagine if you had been in a coma in 2015 and woke up to this nightmare, uh, how unfamiliar it would all seem? But the good news, my friends, is that life was not like this before Justin Trudeau, and it won't be like this after he's gone. <laughs> Our common sense plan may seem simple because it is all the greatest things in life are simple. Comple complexity is the last refuge of the scoundrel. So let's get down to the simple plan that will work, the simple principles that have always worked. We will axe the tax to bring down the cost of heat, gas, and groceries, and we will cut income taxes so that hard work actually pays off again and people can bring home the benefits of their hard work. And we will say here and everywhere, that we will ax the tax. Who in this room is ready to ax the tax? Ax the tax. 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 Fantastic. We have, whenever I, I announce my plan to ax the tax, there's such an outburst of enthusiasm <laughs> that uh, it's just uncontrollable. Um, it's a frenzy, really. Um, and then further compound that with lower income taxes to reward hard work. Some people find these ideas so revolutionary <laughs> after eight years of being broke that they can't contain their enthusiasm. Um, but. Uh, that's a good thing. We need to have some enthusiasm. I think the conservative movement is very enthusiastic these days. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> that the, the, uh, deter, our determination to cut taxes is not just about having you know, a price discount that could be advertised in a dollar store flyer. It's not just about saving pennies here and there. It's about a fundamental philosophical disagreement. We believe that a dollar in the hands of the person who earned it is always more powerful than in the hands of the politician who taxed it. This is a philosophical disagreement that I believe that the welder who can fuse together metals with, with his bare hands is more, has more brain power in how to direct his dollar than the guy who doesn't read his briefing notes, right? And so that is the fundamental philosophical difference when we talk about cutting taxes. And it, it goes further to energy. There's a fundamental philosophical difference there as well. I believe that we should fight to protect our environment and combat climate change with technology and not taxes. I believe in lowering the cost of alternatives rather than raising the cost of traditional energy we still need. I believe 
In greenlighting green projects, Trudeau believes in putting stop signs in front of our workers, and here's the key. I believe in bringing home powerful paychecks for our people rather than what he believes, which is to drive away production into the hands of the dirty dictators. I believe in bringing it home, in other words. So, if you doubt that this is the disagreement, look at every form of energy and transportation Trudeau's fanatical environment minister has opposed. He's obviously against Canadian oil and gas, while he strongly supports coal burning in China and oil production in the Middle East. Uh, he's like Mark Carney that way. Carney's against pipelines in Western Canada at the same time as he sits uh, in the executive towers of a company that bought pipelines in Brazil and the Middle East, right? They're, they're strongly in favor of foreign petroleum interests, but strongly against our workers right here in Canada. Uh, that, that is the view of Justin Trudeau and his successor, his incoming uh, successor, Carbon Tax Carney. They agree on that much. <laughs> and, but furthermore, th but his fanatical environment minister has been in the past against nuclear. Shame. He's against nuclear. Yeah. So we, we, take, we, we shut down nuclear, then half the lights in this room go out right now. As more than half of the electricity in this province of Ontario actually comes from nuclear. Common sense conservatives understand that the best way to add zero emitting baseload electricity across our country is by expanding and safely approving can do reactors and small modular reactors. We're going to unleash the power of our atoms for, free, for clean and low cost energy for our people. Then you've got. And then you've got the minerals of electrification. See, Trudeau wants to subsidize the assembly of foreign raw materials and then send them in packets to the United States where they can be added to electric cars, even though we have those raw materials right here in Canada. We have the sixth biggest supply of lithium anywhere on Earth, but we don't mine any of it because it takes 18 years to get a mine approved, as long as 25 years if you uh, listen to the Government of Canada's own website. So we import lithium that is mined in Chile and refined, burning coal in China so that liberal elites can feel great about themselves driving electric cars that were made burning coal when we could have been powering those mines with clean Canadian energy and driving clean Canadian and powerful paychecks for our people. When I'm Prime Minister, we will repeal the unconstitutional Bill C-69 so that we can approve mines in 18 months rather than 18 years and bring home the production to our country. Yep. And then uh, there's uh, hydroelectric dams. Gilbo, Stephen Gilbo, wants a double approval process to delay the construction of dams that Quebec needs to produce green electricity in Sprava, and the Gouverneur Parliev will eliminate these uh, this, uh, two levels of approval so that we can bring hydroelectric production back into Quebec and throughout Canada the reapproval process for hydroelectric dams that will slow the, their, their construction down by three more years, common sense conservatives will get rid of double processes. We'll have one review and one approval for one project so that we can build more hydroelectric dams in Quebec and right across the country. We're furthermore <laughs> going to unleash the power of natural gas. We have 1,300 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So get the numbers that came out from National Bank. National Bank pointed out that Canada has 0.7 billion tons of emissions. India will be adding many billions of emissions as a result of their use of coal fire. If Canada were to liquefy and export its natural gas to allow India to replace half of its future coal-fired electricity with clean Canadian gas liquefied in Canada, 
we could reduce global emissions by 2.5 billion tons. That's three times more than the entire Canadian economy emits in a year. When I'm Prime Minister, we will, by the way, we have the ability to do this. We have the shortest shipping distance to both Asia and to Europe. 